Happy New Year, booktube, and also a belated Merry Christmas. I did not film anything on Christmas because I had no voice and I was sick the past couple of weeks, so I haven't watched a lot of booktube, but, 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 I hope I'm going to be able to catch up now that I'm much better. And I hope that I'm going to be able to film this video without coughing too much. If I do cough, I'll just cut it out because that's the wonder of editing. Um, so, what is this video? You probably know because of the title. It is my 2022 reading wrap-up. So I'm wrapping up the entire year with uh, statistics, including graphics and pie charts. I figured out how to do that. Uh, at least I hope. Um, and then, uh, what else? Uh, my objectives. Well, I will start with the objectives I had set for 2022 and see how I did with that. And then I'll go into the stats. And then I'll go into my best books and worst books of 2022. And I will not talk about 2023 because I think the video will be long enough as it is and it's 2023 deserves its own video I guess the objectives and the plans and all of that so um so so as I said let, let's go let's wrap up 2022 and I hope you had a good 2022 reading wise and life wise in general if you're living in Ukraine I know that your year sucked um but uh, hopefully you're not living in Ukraine and hopefully things are going well for you and I wish you a very happy 2023 um, um, I'm rambling a bit. I did not take any medication. It's my natural self. <laughs> so um, my, um, let's go to the notebook to know what my objectives for 2022 were. So I had a beautiful page, whoops, a beautiful page of objectives for 2022. Okay, the first one, uh, I remember perfectly well that I threw that one out at the window um, at the end of January because it quickly appeared to be unrealistic. I wanted to reduce my TBR to 90 books. Uh, I started the year at about 138 and uh, I ended the year at 168. So it was plus 30 and not the minus 60 I was hoping, minus 50 I was hoping for. So that one is an absolute utter fail, but I'm fine with it because I don't really care about it anymore. The second objective was to read a book by each of the 10 authors named on the next page. So that stems from a tag that I did. It was the Moops and the Gripes bucket list tag and I named 10 women authors I had never read before and I wanted to read at least one book by. Um, and these 10 women were Charlotte Bronte, Louise Erdrich, Elizabeth Gaskell, Roxane Gay, Elizabeth George, Georgette Hager, Ursula K. Le Guin, Eudora Welty, Edith Wharton, and Virginia Woolf. And I decided at the beginning of the year that I would read at least one book by each of these 10 women. And I read seven of these women. Um, some of them, it was just wonderful. And I know that I discovered authors I'm going to read a lot and love a lot. And there was one utter disaster. And that will come back later in this video in one of the worst books that I've read this year. So seven out of 10, I think it's not bad. Uh, the three I haven't read are Roxane Ye, Ursula K. Le Guin and Eudora Welty. Um, and I don't really know why I did not pick up their books. Um, I, hopefully I'm going to do that next year. I did read a few opinion pieces by Roxane Gay, though they were not books per se. They were opinion pieces, I don't know, in the New York Times or things like that. Uh, so I have read some Roxane Gay, so I'm not, um, it's not like I haven't read a single line by her, but I haven't read any book. So um, it's, it's, it's mainly bad feminist I had in mind. But anyway, seven out of 10, not bad. Okay, uh, next objective was not so much, uh, not as precise. It was a bit more vague. It was keep reading poetry and learn more about poetry. So I did read some poetry. I read a few collections of poetry. However, um, I cannot say that this was really a priority for me after a few weeks in um, 2022. Uh, for some reason, poetry did not bring me the pleasure I was hoping it would bring me. So, um, I did read poetry, so in a way I did fulfill that objective, but in another way um, it was not as satisfying as I hoped it would be. The next one, however, uh, explore the world of the Iliad. At the end of 2021, I read the Iliad by Homer for the first time, and it was a revelation. I just absolutely loved that book, and I set as an objective to keep reading books like that, to keep reading about the ancient world. And I did that. Uh, so in January, I read The Odyssey, and that was with a, a book club. 
uh, hosted by David Wiley and Sherry Swearingen. That doesn't exist anymore. Uh, but I did read these two books with them. And then for a few months, I did nothing about it. And then in the summer, I started to read ancient classics again, and I just utterly loved it. And I'm going to keep doing that in 2023. I know it's not about, this video is not about 2023, but I'm going to keep doing that. And then uh, the last objective was to explore the possibilities of booktube. Uh, so uh, make an original tag, buddy reads, group reads and things like that. And I think I did that. Um, I did just one original tag and it's, it's I have no merit whatsoever. I just took something that was done in writing and I decided to make a video about it. Basically, it was the literary World Cup tag. Um, so <laughs> not a lot of creativity in there for me, uh, but I did do an original tag. And, um, and I did buddy reads and group reads and uh, I did, I think, use more the possibilities of booktube. Uh, so I, I'm very happy with that. Basically, I think I just meant just keep, keep doing booktube for a year. Um, <laughs> I think that's what it meant. So that, that, that I did. And there's another objective that is not in there, but I'm pretty sure I mentioned it in my video about my 2023, in my 2022 objectives. And it was to read four of the books, of the longest books on my TBR. Um, in December of 2021, I had made two videos about the longest books on my TBR, one for fiction and one for nonfiction. And I set as an objective to read four of them. I have not read four of these books. I've read one of these books, I believe. Um, I have read long books in 2023, but not these ones. I read books that I had not bought yet, that I had not, that I did not own at that time. Um, so that that is a semi-success because I did read long books, but not necessarily the ones I already had. So that's, uh, yeah, that, that's a semi-success, I guess. And uh yeah, so, so that's it for the objectives of 2022. Um, it feels like these were set such a long time ago and some of them are just not relevant anymore. So that, that that's why I don't care very much whether it's a success or not. I don't, it's a bit weird. Um, I should stick with reading objectives for a year, but apparently after a few months, they were no longer relevant. It's like the number of books of my, my TBR, I gave up on that very quickly because I realized it was not important in the end. So anyway, um, let's go into some statistics. And I will refer a lot to my notebook for that because I did not learn these numbers by heart. And that is where we will get the pie charts and the graphics and all of that. I, I hope it's I, I hope it's going to be a success. And it, it, by the way, that's why I'm sort of not in the middle of the frame. It's because I, I want to leave room for the um, wonderful graphics. So uh, how many books did I read in 2022? Uh, total. 145. That's the highest number I've ever read. However, in number of pages, I'm not sure it's the highest I've ever read. Uh, not that I counted previously, but uh, I, I read a lot of shorter books. I read 42 books that were under 200 pages, and in those 42, there were 16 that were under 100 pages. So that includes a lot of plays that I read. I read ancient Greek plays and play modern plays, and I, I read a bunch of plays this year. So um, that, that's the reason why the, the number of books is rather high. In number of pages, it is 41,440 pages. So I think that's rather in line with what I read last year. I don't really remember. So the first pie chart. <laughs> It is a fiction versus nonfiction. I read 97 books of fiction and 48 nonfiction. So that's about two thirds fiction and one third nonfiction, which is, I suppose, not abnormal. But last year I was 50 50. So in 2021, I was 50 50. And the year before that, I was close to 50 50. So it's um, so I read fewer nonfiction this year or rather I read more fiction this year. I don't know. <laughs> it, it's somewhere in there. The balance was changed. So within the fiction, uh, the form, uh, there were two graphic novels, three collections of poetry, five collections of short stories, six epic poems, 11 plays, and 69 novels. So uh, clearly in fiction, what I read most is novels. And uh, within the novels, I decided to divide it into categories. I read 13 mysteries, 20 romances and 37 general fiction. And I say that I like historical stuff. Of the 13 mysteries, seven were historical mysteries, so set in the Victorian era, the Middle Ages or whatever. Uh, of the romances, 17 were historical romances. So uh, I think uh, that's clearly where my preference lies. And in general fiction, however, there were just three uh, historical fiction. 
in nonfiction. So I read 48 nonfiction and uh, I include in there one picture book and two graphic nonfiction. Um, but I did not create a category for those because nonfiction I categorize by content, not by form. So um, yes, the content of nonfiction. Uh, I read one book about languages, three books of uh, about nature, three books of journalism, three books of literary criticism, four books of travel and adventure, six biographies, six books of history, 10 collection of essays or single essays, and 12 memoirs. And that is a bit of a surprise because if you ask me what is the genre of nonfiction you like the least, I will probably answer memoirs. I I'm not somebody who reads memoirs. Now, of course, uh, probably half of them, if not more, were read because of the BookTube Prize. Um, I read uh, nonfiction uh, in the nonfiction division for the BookTube Prize, and memoirs are very, very popular in the BookTube Prize. So probably half of them are for that. Um, I also say that history is my favorite, and I just read six books of history, so that's just uh, one eighth. No, one sixth. 48 divided by six, one eighth. I was right. Uh, one eighth of the nonfiction that I read. That I read. Um, however, more of these books were about history. So the six biographies that I read, five of them were of dead people. So I guess this is history. Of the memoirs that I read, at least two of them were memoirs of World War I. So again, I count that as history somewhere. Uh, same thing about uh, the uh, adventure and travel. Uh, one of them was about the, um, can we say, discovery of the source of the Nile. Uh, so this, again, was history. So uh, even though it's I did not categorize them as history. Many of these books look towards the past. The next pie chart, I don't know if it's going to interest anyone but me, but I prepared it, so I'm going to use it. Um, I read 103 of my own books, so books, paper books that I own. I read 31 books from the library and 11 books from Scribd. I did not prepare a chart about uh, paper books versus ebooks or audiobooks because audiobooks would be zero. Well, that, that's one that I listen, one or two that I listen partially on audiobook, um, but basically it's it's not really worth it. And same thing for ebooks. Um, so all the books from Scribd are ebooks, so that's at least 11, and a few from the library were also ebooks. But my own books, they were all paper books. So I think uh, it's obvious and clear that I prefer paper books to ebooks or audiobooks. Another statistic that I thought would be much more interesting is the original date of publication. So do I read new releases or older books? You probably already know the answer. So I uh, divided it into various time periods. So the farther back we go in time, the longer the time period and the closer to us, the shorter the time period. So the first time period is antiquity. So basically from the invention of writing to the fall of the Western Roman Empire, so about the year 500. And I read 11 books that were written during that time. Um, the Middle Ages, from the year about 500 to 1500, I read one book. Modern times, uh, for the purposes of this graph, it's going to be from the year 1500 to the year 1799, and I read one book uh, that was written originally during that time, and that was a play by Molière. Um, 19th century, uh, so we are getting closer to us, the time period is getting shorter, so now it's a 100 year. Um, I read 15 books originally published in the 19th century. I read 41 books originally published in the 20th century. Um, and then I decided to divide the last 22 years in three categories. The first chunk covers uh, the year 2000 to 2020. Uh, so uh, the first 20 years of the millennia, and I read 40 books that were or originally published during those 20 years. And then I decided to uh, divide new releases into 2021 and 2022, and I read uh, 23 books in, that were originally published in 2021 and 13 that were originally published in 2022. Um, the two colors in the graph uh, show the divide between fiction and nonfiction. So all the books that I read that were originally published before the 20th century, they were all they were all fiction. So I did not read any ancient nonfiction. And then in the books for the 20th century, I read eight nonfiction. In the books for 20, uh, the, the first 20 years of uh, our millennia, uh, 10 were nonfiction, so a quarter of what I read was nonfiction. And then where it gets interesting, it's in the last two years and the new releases, 2021 and 2022. So uh, these two years together, I read 36 books 
And of these 36, 28 were nonfiction. So for nonfiction, I really read much more recent books than in fiction. Uh, I read only three fiction that were released this year, 2022. Um, I, and I think they were all category fiction. I think it was two mysteries and one romance or two romances and one mystery, something like that. Um, and same thing for 2021. Most of the books that I read that were published in 2021 were for the Booktube Prize. And because I read only nonfiction for the Booktube Prize, that means that I read almost um, all nonfiction for, for 2021. Uh, the books that I read that were published in 2021 were almost all nonfiction. And then, uh, and then we are going into a different type of graph. We are going into a map. Uh, I took that idea from Jim, from the channel Jim's, Jim's Books Reading and Stuff. And he talks about geographical diversity in our reading, and I think it's very important. Um, I want to read about the world. Books are my main entry, my main window into the world. So if I want to read about the world, I should read about a whole bunch of different places. Uh, Jim makes his map based on the author's place of birth. I decided to make my map based on the location, the setting of the book or the subject of the book. Uh, because I thought it was more relevant. So, um, for example, I recently read a book by a Canadian journalist about Ukraine, and I think that book tells me a lot more about Ukraine than it tells me about Canada. So I decided that that book, the, the, the important country in that book was Ukraine. So um, so the, the countries that I visited, I, I'm going to call it that, visiting countries uh, through books, uh, I visited 28 countries and quite a few of these countries I would not have visited had it not been for the two readathons hosted by Mark from Book Time with Elvis related to football or soccer. Uh, we started the year with the African Cup of Nation, uh, which is the soccer tournament for the African countries. And because of that, I read about five books uh, set in Africa. And I, that, that, that just started the year with a lot of diversity. And then we did that again for the World Cup. And this time I visited a bit more. Um, I stayed a bit more in Europe. Uh, but nevertheless, it did take me to a few places I maybe would not have gone uh, had I not picked up that country for that readathon. So uh, in alphabetical order, the countries that I visited, Argentina, who won the World Cup. Uh, and I read a book by an Argentinian author set in Argentina just because of the World Cup. Uh, up to the end of December, well, mid-December, I had not read anything set in Argentina, but the, 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 the readathon made me read one. So Argentina, Australia, Austria, Cameroon, Canada, Egypt, France, Gambia, Greece, um, I should say that is ancient Greece, not modern Greece, uh, Guinea, Haiti, Honduras, Iran, and then I wrote Iraq. Uh, I have sort of the problem that when I read ancient books, uh, they are set in countries that don't exist anymore, such as Mesopotamia or Babylon or something like that. And I decided to use the modern country, the uh, the location on the map. I w where is that? Where is the location on the map? And then look at what the borders of the actual the the, the contemporary country is. So uh, I did not read anything set in modern day Iraq. I read something read set in Mesopotamia, uh, in ancient in ancient day Iraq. But I still count it as visiting a place where I don't live. So I'm including it in there. Um, and then after Iraq, Ireland, Italy, Japan. Morocco, Nepal, Nigeria, Russia, Rwanda, Spain, Sweden, Tanzania, United Kingdom, United States, and Ukraine. So that's 28 countries, and I'm quite happy with it, but uh, for next year, maybe I'll try to do better. And finally, the last statistics, uh, the authors that I read the most. Um, I'm not the sort of person who reads a ton of books by the same author, normally. Um, I don't necessarily read series, and if I read series, I don't read them all in a row. Uh, I like variety, and I rarely read the same author twice in a row or twice in a short time. However, there have been a few exceptions this year. So um, there are three tiers, bronze, silver, and gold. Uh, bronze level, uh, with three books each, I have two winners, two authors, Sophocles and Thomas King. Uh, at the silver level, with five books each, Jane Austen and Julia Quinn. And I should say that Jane Austen, they were rereads. Uh, I read five of her novels and they were rereads for me. And at the gold level, with nine books, is Georgette Heyer. Uh, so she's a writer of romance. She is one of the 10 authors I wanted to read at the beginning of the year. And I read one of her books that I borrowed from the library. 
and I just fell in love with it. And I just, I just love that book so much that when I went to a used bookstore and I saw that they had a little stack of George at Hire, I bought them all. And since then, I've read the, quite a few of them. I, I'm not yet finished and I keep finding more and I keep buying them and I keep reading them. So I read nine books by Georgette Heyer. And I cannot say that they were all extraordinarily good. They were all good and none of them made me uh, question why I read that author. Because sometimes it happens, you read an author and you like them and then you read one book and you just question, why do I read that? Because that's really bad. Um, in the case of Georgette High, it's just some of them did not age well because these are romances that were written um, in the, well, not necessarily early, but middle of the 20th century. She started in the 1920s and she wrote all the way to the 1960s and some things did not age well. But beyond that, I just really love her books. So that's it for the statistics. So now if you if you if you are watching this video just for the graphs, I guess uh, you're, well you're done <laughs> because I I'm out of graphics uh, for this video. Uh, however, now is the moment for the tops and uh, well the best and worst of the year. So the tops and flops to borrow from uh, Britta Bowler. Um, I'm going to start by giving awards. Do, do I call them awards? I'm going to call them awards. A sort of best book in certain categories and then I'm going to do my top five fiction and my top five non-fiction. Oh and in the middle I'm going to do the worst books that I read. The worst fiction and worst non-fiction. So let's start with the best by category. Oh no, there's a stats that I forgot. I forgot one statistic. After the author that I read the most, the story that I read the most. <laughs> it is Antigone. Uh, so this is one of the stories that I read. I read the original in translation, of course, by Sophocles. And then I wrote, uh, I read, uh, I read, um, I read rewritings of the story of Antigone. So I read The Burial at Thieves by Seamus Heaney and I read um, um, Antigonic by Anne Carson and uh, this one by Jean Anouy and they, they were all wonderful. So this is the story I read the most. I read it four times by four different authors uh, and despite the differences, it's all clearly the story of Antigone. So that was a lot of fun and I made a video about that. So I'm going to leave a link to that in the description box. So uh, now back to the best and worst of the year. So my best classic, because I read quite a few classics, as like I said, and I will give the award to uh, Gilgamesh and the version by um, Herbert Mason. So this is not so much a translation. There's clearly a lot of adaptation going on in there. Uh, bits that were removed, bits that were changed, bits that were perhaps sanitized a little bit. Uh, but I, I read this, um, it's the first that I read after the, the six months that I did not really read any classics that classic of the ancient world. Uh, I had read the Odyssey in January and then I didn't pick anything up until until June or July. Um, and this one started it. I read this and oh my god, I just fell in love with it. It was wonderful. And if you don't read classics, I, I suggest you start with this one. It's very, very good. I don't think it's that faithful to the original, but it's really, really good. So uh, that, that was my best classic of the year. Uh, that being said, I'm cheating a little bit because I'm creating a t category for the best play that I read this year. <laughs> and I'm going to choose another classic. I'm going to go with Oedipus the King. So this is the copy that I read in college. And at the time, I cannot say that I really liked it. And then I read the translation in English, which I'm not showing. Um, it's behind the Christmas tree. <laughs> it's I, the, the one in this book. Uh, so the, the translation in this book, and I just absolutely loved it and I thought it was I could see how brilliant that play was and what a tragedy a Greek tragedy is and yeah I, I thought it was really really awesome so th this would be my best uh my, my best play of the year even though um there's an honorable mention for this one because it was very good too uh anyway I, I, I I'm trying to stick just with one because yeah, the plays that I read, they were pretty much all classics in their own right. So uh, they, they were all very good. I did not read a bad one. Uh, anyway, anyway, l let's keep going uh, because I don't want this video to be th three hours long, not even one hour long. I, I was aiming for 30 minutes. Uh, I'm, st I'm still, <laughs> I still have a chance to make it last 30 minutes. Uh, next, oh, best romance, because I did read quite a few romance. And I would say that my favorite is um, The Grand Sophie by uh, Georgette Heyer. Um, I have, however, an honorable mention. The honorable mention would be Boyfriend Material by Alexis Hall. Uh, it's one of the very few uh, contemporary romance that I read this year, and I really liked it. It was uh, the first time that I read a gay romance, and at first I was wondering if I would really 
uh, get hooked with the story because, I don't know, I read romance in a way to project myself in a fantasy world and I was thinking, well, I'm not a gay man, what do I care? And it turns out that I really do care. It's really, really good. Um, I really liked it. So th this one is very good too. However, I do prefer historical romances. So I think of all the Georgia Tires that I read, The Grand Sophie is my favorite because of the character. Uh, the romance itself is... Uh, is um well the the roman the romantic interest is a cousin which of course uh 200 years later it's not that sexy anymore uh but um it's the, the character of sophie is just wonderful and it's just a pleasure to read this it's so much fun so i really like this one and then the next category is best mystery um i had a hard time to choose so i decided to go with the series that i preferred and it is the brother cat file series i read two books so this is an omnibus of three books and i read the first two in this one which are the sanctuary sparrow and the devil's novice the, and the devil's novice i just read uh, during christmas time um just during the time that i was sick and it's just so comforting uh, it, it's well built. There's not a lot of sleuthing, I would say. Uh, we don't see necessarily um, Brother Catfowl going to question people. He just goes about his life and then he gathers information here and there. And then at the end, it's just all put together. And sometimes we know quite before the end who the guilty party is, but sometimes we just don't know exactly the reason why. So it's just the reason that comes out at the end. Uh, but anyway, it's uh, the, the research is very well done. Uh, this is set uh, during the middle ages um, in the 12th century in England and it's really really it's really interesting I, re I really love that series so I'm going to give the the trophy I don't know if there's a trophy the, the mention for the best mystery to uh, Brother Catfa. Now now it's time for the worst books that I've read in 2022. Um, the worst non-fiction. Um, I have to say that most of the nonfiction I read this year was very good. I don't have a lot to complain about. Uh, so the worst nonfiction would go to Miss Dior uh, by Justine Picardi. Um, I made an entire video about that book, so I'm going to leave a link to it in the description box below. And the problem I had with that book was that it was only half about the topic. So this is supposed to be a biography of the sister of the designer Christian Dior. Um, and she was a woman who was part of the resistance during the Second World War in France. She was deported to a concentration camp. Uh, she had to move from concentration camp from one to the other to the other. She managed to survive and then she came back to Paris. And then Picardi apparently just loses interest in her. Uh, she was interested in her protagonist only because she was the sister of Christian Dior. And she kept looking for Miss Dior in the work of Christian Dior, of the designer, and clearly she had nothing to do with that. And yeah, it, it was not a very well done book, in my opinion. Uh, the book itself was beautiful. It was printed on beautiful paper full of beautiful pictures, uh, but the content was a bit off topic, and that was very, very odd. So that that's the worst nonfiction that I've read this year. Uh, for worst fiction, I have two candidates, but one of them is not in English, so um, I decided to choose another one. So that this one is a terrible novel. Um, this is so this one is not translated in English. It's originally written in Japanese. Um, it, according to the back of the book, it's supposed to be about uh, two women who open some sort of bed and breakfast in the countryside where they welcome everyone. So I figured, okay, this is going to be a feel-good book. Um, however, there are so many issues with it. Uh, I talked about it in my June wrap-up, if I remember correctly. So I'm going to leave a link to that in the description box. I'm going to have to spoil the book. Uh, so if you don't want any spoilers, just skip ahead a little bit until I'm holding a different book. Um, the problem with that book is is, is that um, at twice uh, the, the what happens that there's a character who's so depressive they are suicidal they are about to kill themselves but uh, they are cured uh, by a conversation in a good meal and that's all it takes to cure someone of uh, suicidal thoughts and uh, at the end of the book uh, there's the son of one of the two women protagonists in the book um, who tries to commit suicide because uh, he was in love with his stepmother, which is something something a bit weird, something uh, absolutely not announced, not well brought out, and it's just, it makes no sense, basically. It's just, anyway. So uh, if you want more, uh, if you want a rant on my part, uh, go watch that video. And if you want an absolute rant, I will suggest you go watch my video of uh, Elizabeth George, A Banquet of Consequences. 
Um, I did not like that book and that is not saying much. I thought it was terrible. Um, it's a mystery. Uh, it's a very long mystery and um, you may remember from the beginning of this video, which feels like a very long time ago, that Elizabeth George was one of the 10 authors I wanted to read. So this was the first book that I read by Elizabeth George. I started in the middle of her Lindley series. I did not start at the beginning, so I just picked a book that I found at a used bookstore and that was that. I decided to, to start there. And I don't know if I started with the worst, but it is terrible. Um, so we have two investigators in there and they are separated. So there's uh, Inspector Lindley and um, what's his sidekick's name? Barbara Havers. And they are in two different towns. So it means that to, to so that the two are updated, everything is repeated twice. Um, it goes into so many details that are utterly, utterly useless. Um, for example, if they go to interrogate a person, they don't just go to that person's place. They park the car, walk that street, cross the park, reach the door, they ring once, they ring twice, they can hear footsteps, the person opens the door, they start to talk. And all of that is utterly useless to the investigation. And they it's done every time a character moves. And there are things that make no sense at all. Uh, one thing that makes absolutely no sense is that Barbara Havers is about to be fired if she, she steps if she steps one toe in the wrong place, she's going to be fired. And one of the things that she does is to stay like in a hotel, but it's not a hotel, it's the victim's house. She decides to use the victim's house as the place where she's going to stay for the investigation, which is utterly ridiculous. It makes no sense. Um, and there were plenty of things like that. Uh, so if you want a real good rant, <laughs> go watch that video. I was incensed at the time. Now it's been six months. I don't care as much. Uh, but at the time, I was really, really disappointed. And by the way, in that video, I spoiled the ending. I could not help myself because I think the ending, the bad ending was part of the badness of the book. Uh, it's a terrible book. So that that's the worst fiction that I've read this year. Now, happier thoughts, my top five fiction of the year. Um, they are in no particular order. Um, I think they are in the order they fit in the pile. And these are my top five fiction of the year. Uh, top five novels, I should say, because I already mentioned a best romance, a best mystery, a best play, and a best classic, and I guess they, they count as fiction too. Uh, so my top five novels of 2022. Now, of course, there were not books published in 2022. There are books that I've read in 2022. I should have mentioned that at the beginning of the video, but I guess you know how it works. If you watch my channel, you're somebody who knows how booktube works. <laughs> so uh, the first one I'm going to mention is, again, well, this time, unfortunately for real, uh, not translated in English. Uh, if I translate the title in English, it would be Never Wipe Away Tears Without Gloves. And it is about the AIDS crisis in the 1980s in Stockholm, in Sweden. And that is just such a moving book. That being said, I would not recommend it to anyone. Uh, I would not recommend it to my mother because it's full of vulgarities in there. Well, vulgarities, it's not vulgarities, but there are um, clear references to uh, sexual acts between men. And I don't think it's something my mother would like to read. Uh, that being said, I thought it was just absolutely wonderful. And um, yeah, I cried. It's the book that made me cry the most. I guess I should have given an award for that. So I'm going to give it to that book. The book that made me cry the most and was this one. It was uh, very moving and uh, I hope it's going to get translated in English at some point. Uh, the author I forgot to mention is Jonas Gardell. So I really hope for you it gets translated in English because it's really worth it. Uh, the others, uh, some of them I have in French, but they are translated in English. Uh, this book I read for Caribbean. It is Love, Anger, Madness by Marie Vieux Chauvet. Uh, she's an author from Haiti and this is a trilogy, but the trilogy was published as one book. Uh, so the three stories in this book are independent from an, one another. However, the atmosphere is very much the same and clearly it, uh, it refers to the same events. It refers to uh, the beginning of the Duvalier dictatorship in the 1960s. Um, and yeah, it's a very harsh book. Once again, it's not something I would recommend to my mother. It's very difficult to read. Um, it, it's a punch in the gut, but it's absolutely worth your time. Um, yeah, it's, it, I guess my best books of the year are the sort of books that stay with you for a very long time. And this one is going to stay for a long time. And I read this for Caribbean, so keep an eye out for Caribbean for next year. Uh, it is a reading event hosted in June, and we are encouraged to read books written by authors from the Caribbean. And this book is by an author from Haiti. 
Another punch in the gut kind of book is Morambi, the Book of Bones by Boubacar Boris Diop. Uh, the author is from Senegal, but the book is about uh, the genocide in Rwanda. And it was written a few years afterwards, about uh, 20 years after, not, not even 20 years, I think about 15 years after the genocide. And um, it, it is a harsh book. It is a difficult book, but once again, so worth it. Um, in this one, as opposed to uh, Marie Vieux-Chouret, in this one, we see the violence up close. In this one, there's a bit of, um, and there's a word that doesn't exist in English, the word is pudeur. Um, it's, it's a sense of, um, of holding back by the author. The author chooses not to look at certain things from too close. Um, and yeah, we don't. We do see the rivers of blood, but we don't see necessarily the the, the hacking and the massacres. So uh, anyway, it's very very well done, and it's very very good. Um, if you're in the mood for this kind of book, it's totally worth it. Uh, then I'm going a bit more into classics. Uh, the House of Mirth by Edith Wharton. Uh, this book was published in 1903 or five at the beginning of the 20th century, and it is about uh, upper classes in New York. It's about a woman very much trying to hold on to her status, uh, Lily Bart. And I read this as a buddy read with uh, Shelley Sferingen, and um, it, it was, uh, it's a great book. And of course, the buddy read, uh, th that's the one thing I realized this year doing buddy reads, is that it uh, makes the book, um, the reading a bit more intense, the reading experience. I am more aware of what I read when I do a buddy read or a group read. And this one uh, really was a great book to read as a buddy read. So The House of House of Mirth by Edith Wharton. Um, it's another author that I said I would read for the first time this year, and I did. As so far, it's the only one that I've read by her, but I know I'm going to read more. I just love this book really, really much. And uh, the last of my top five, uh, it is uh, The Prime of Miss Jean Brodie by Muriel Sparks. Uh, the character of Miss Jean Brodie is another wonderful character. Um, and it, it's not very long, so this one reads very well, and it's full of humor, and it's, it's hard to describe this book. So it's about um, a character named Jean Brody, and she has students. She's a teacher, and she has students, and among her students, she has favorite, favorite girls. And she has a special relationship with these favorite girls. And not much happens in a way because she, she keeps telling stories about herself and that's what she does. And uh, basically she's holding herself as an example to her girls, saying, if you do like me, you're going to be great. And it turns out that it's not quite the truth, uh, but however, it, it's, it's so much fun. Um, I, I really enjoyed this book. So if you're not into very hard and sad books, because I guess all the ones that I talked about previously are sad in some sort of way, uh, this one is a much happier book. Not that there's a happy ending, but on the tone of it is much lighter. Eh? We're not reading a tragedy. Um, it's it's the tone is much lighter. So th this it, it's almost a comedy. Is it a comedy? Uh, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a bit of a bittersweet comedy, but there's a lot of comedy in the book. So that's my top five fiction of the year. Uh, the top five nonfiction. This one in no particular order except for the last, because the last book I'm going to mention is going to be my favorite book of the year. Um, so uh, my top five nonfiction, that it's a bit all over the place. So uh, this, um, the title in English is For Want of a Fir Tree, uh, Ukraine Undone. And it is by journalist Frédéric Lavoie. Uh, so this is not about 2022 Ukraine, it's about the situation that happened in 2014-2015. And I thought it was just so enlightening about what is the situation right now. It explains a lot of what is going on now in Ukraine, even though it's about events that happened five or six years ago. Uh, it, it's short, uh, It's I gave you the title in English, so if you have the chance to read it, it's totally worth it. And this was supposed to be a top five, a quick top five, I'm not supposed to talk about the book in that much length. I'll go quicker for the other ones. Uh, so uh, this one, Into Thin Air by John Krakauer. This is uh, a journalist who is specialized in outdoor and travel event uh, journalism. And uh, he, in the 1990s, at the end of the 1990s, he got, he became part of an expedition, commercial expedition to the summit of Mount Everest. And that expedition was a catastrophe, people died, and this is his account of what happened. And also he made some investigations to try to, to make sure that he had all the facts correct. So he, it's not just a memoir, it's not just his recollection, there's also journalism that's part of it. And it's super interesting, it is fascinating. Um, a book that I just read for Nonfiction November, The Tigress of Forley by Elizabeth Lev. Um, 
I love that book because I think I love the period and because the character of Katerina Sforza is just extraordinary. She lived during a time period that's just fascinating and over the top um, in the way they lived. And it's just a fascinating insight into that period. So I really enjoyed that book. The last two of my top 10 I read uh, as library books. I don't have copies. So uh, one of them is one that I read very early at the, uh, at the beginning of the year. Uh, it's Pastoral Song by James Rebanks. Uh, this is part memoir and part nature book. Uh, so James Rebanks is a farmer in England and he talks about industrial farming and how bad that is for the land, how bad that is long term for human beings and how we should go back to smaller scale farming and how that would be good. And it was super interesting. Why, what do I care about farming? I don't care about farming, but when I read this, I cared. And I think that's the mark of a very good book. And finally, my favorite nonfiction of the year and my favorite non book of the year, all category confounded. It is We Don't Know Ourselves, A Personal History of Ireland by Fintan O'Toole. And the reason why I love that book so much, I, I don't think it's only because of the book. It's not just because of the content, but it's because of the conversations that it sparked with my father. So uh, Fintan O'Toole uh, was born in the 1950s in um, Ireland. And he decides to use his lifetime as the frame for a history of modern Ireland. And uh, so he starts by painting the picture of what Ireland was in the 1950s. And the reason I say it started uh, conversations with my father is because um, there were very often comparisons were made between Ireland and the province of Quebec because there were many similarities. Um, both were regions, countries slash provinces under English domination. Uh, in both cases, the church, Catholic church, had a very strong grip on the personal lives of people, on the, on the governmental decisions. Um, the, the lifestyle and the situation generally, social situation of people in Ireland and people in the province of Quebec were very similar. Um, however, at some point it started to change. So uh, I was talking to my father about the situation in the 1950s in Ireland and he said, yeah, well, that was pretty much what it was in the province of Quebec too. And as I kept reading the book, I kept asking my father about these changes. When did they happen in Quebec? And what becomes clear is that the, the, the destiny, the road of Ireland and Quebec towards moder mo modernity was very different. In the province of Quebec, it went a lot faster. In the 1960s, Quebec started to modernize. Uh, the church was sort of put aside very quickly. Uh, it got out of schools, out of hospitals. Uh, things became, the government became secular, basically. So it became um, just w without religion everywhere. Um, the, the school system was modernized. Um, electricity was brought a little bit everywhere in the province and same thing for plumbing. Uh, that had started in the 1950s. Uh, in Quebec, it's, all, it's called the Quiet Revolution because by the end of the 1960s, how the way people lived had almost nothing to do with the way they lived at the beginning of the 1950s. So it was over 20 years and it's often associated with the election of a particular prime minister, well, it's not prime minister, it's the premier uh, of the province in 1960, Jean Lesage. However, the, the changes had started a little bit in the 1950s. Uh, but by the 1960s, the changes were going rapidly and very quickly. And by the end of the 1960s, the province of Quebec was a modern country. However, in Ireland, it took a lot longer than that. And one statistic that sort of confounded me, that was, wow, that, that, that is incredible, is that uh, by the end of the 1980s, so at the early 1990s, still 90% of the population went to church at least once a week. And in the province of Quebec, that, that was absolutely not true. Uh, by the 1960s, people stopped going to church. They did not necessarily stop believing in God, but they stopped going to church regularly. They went for social events like weddings and funerals and baptisms, and they went for special occasions like Christmas and Easter. And they did not necessarily go every week. Perhaps they went once in a while. And then gradually people stopped going even for these occasions. And now in the province of Quebec, half the couples don't even bother to get married at all. Um, most, I think most of the children are not baptized. Um, it's, it's just, nobody cares about these things anymore. And in the 19, at the end of the 1980s and 1990s, um, my mother took me to church relatively regularly. Uh, I was serving mass once every three weeks, approximately. 
and I never met any of my classmates there. So people were not going to church regularly at the end of the 1980s, early 1990s in the province of Quebec. So that, that statistic just, I was flabbergasted by it. And there was plenty of things like that. I was just completely flabbergasted about the situation in Ireland in the past 67 years. Um, but it was absolutely, utterly fascinating. And as I said, because of the conversations I had with my father, it was just the most interesting reading experience I had this year. So that's why I give this one the best book I read in 2022. So, uh, okay, the image is going away and I guess I'm going to go away too. So this video is almost an hour long. Okay, <laughs> it's 50 minutes long. I guess I'm going to stop talking now and my voice is going away a little. So I I'm just going to ask you, what were the best books and the worst books that you've read this year? And, and I'm going to stop talking and I'm going to say thank you everyone for watching. And I will see you in the next video that should come quite soon. I'm going to talk about my plans and objectives for 2023. And that should be a lot shorter than 50 minutes. <laughs> so thank you everyone for watching and I'll see you in the next video. À la prochaine.